Now, uh, what time warning do I get? A two uh, minute warning. You get a two minute warning at eight minutes. Okay. Go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Chan Stevens with Neutron Fusion, joined by George Gassaway, teammate, and listening in the background, so to speak, is Pat Peterson, the uh, third teammate who was the primary author of this report on just the Vanna White in the presentation. Ours is on floating head pistons and uh, one more optimization approach we took. For those of you not familiar with the floating head piston, and I don't think there are many left in this room that don't know what floating head pistons are, this is a standard approach to uh, rocketry performance improvement. The floating head means at the end of the piston's extension, the motor <coughs> continues to lift it off the support rod and the pressure at that point builds inside the tube, overcomes the friction fit of the rocket on the motor and shoots it off and all kinds of wonderful things happen. So we are working on that launch concept. Now previous piston studies, and there have been a bunch, uh, many of them by us as well, generally have concluded that longer pistons are better. And there are some qualifiers to that in particular. The longer pistons tend to need a little bit of initial volume that's offset the distance between the aft end of your motor and the piston head so that you can use that initial volume to uh, dampen the oscillations. If you haven't tuned a long piston, then you may not see the improved performance because you'll get oscillations that can result in temporary negative thrust spikes. So we've tuned 68 inch piston performance and found that longer is generally better. The other general conclusion prior research has shown is that heavier tends to get better benefit from piston than lighter models. That goes back to the uh, Bumbling Brothers in Aero 47 when they found uh, that Egloff models seemed to get more of a kick than a lightweight, say, altitude model or something like that. At, time, at that time, it was really kind of unexplored. And what we've since concluded is that basically heavier models, weight is one of the attributes in the math of the piston pressure build performance factors. So heavier models, contribute to greater pressure build. They spend more time on the piston and therefore get more benefit from the augmenting, uh, augmentation of the thrust profile. Now mind you, I want to stress one of our earlier research projects proved that you get more impulse through pistons. Okay, This is not just recapturing lost energy off a blast deflector or something like that. It actually can turn a B motor into C impulse class kind of performance, that kind of stuff. So what we're trying to do here is spend more time on the piston to cheat the physics, so to speak, and get more augmentation of pressure building. So what we try to do here in our approach is look at, is there some way we can kind of share the love and get a heavy weight performance benefit extended into the lower weight class models? Now, obviously, you don't want to fly, you know, you don't want to put an egg capsule on the top of your altitude model and, and expect it to be a higher performance, okay? So we're not suggesting that you make the model heavier. What we did, though, is we looked at the piston equipment and said, well, wait a minute. One of the reasons a 68-inch piston performs better than a 34-inch is because this thing weighs twice as much as a 34-inch piston. And hmm. the weight applies to the entire system of the floating head concept, not the, not the support rod and the piston head. But the weight of the support uh, of the tube, the weight of the model, the weight of the motor. So we also added weight to the piston tube, to this thing. Now the model is leaving this in two tenths of a second. But we get the full benefit of that weight during the travel, during the pressure build. And when we've lost the benefit of the pressure build, the model separates so you get high altitude performance and normal model performance. So we looked at a very unconventional approach of adding weight to the launch <coughs> system to get heavier weight performance. So that was our hypothesis. If we make the piston itself heavier, can we get heavy weight performance without a penalty to the rocket itself? Oh, uh, so we evaluated weight of this using our 16-inch piston. We did no research on the 34. I can get into that later, but basically, We've well established that 68 is much better performance than 34, so we saw no need to study 34. 68 is the way we wanted to go. So we did static flights uh, with models ranging from 60 to 88 to 112 grams of weight. Now in theory, what we want to do here is make sure that whatever weight we add to the model, and the system rather, is going to be more than uh, offset by the impulse we get in the game. 
In other words, we don't want, we don't want to double the weight and only get a 50% improvement on the impulse. So we looked at the, the benefit there. Um, we also ruled out things like drag and, and we treated that as basically an insignificant factor by a longer tube, even though that is mathematically in there. It's just a very insignificant amount. So this is the, uh, the standard that we held to. Basically, if we measure the impulse gain and the acceleration under the heavy weight and compare that to uh, the impulse gain, we want to make sure that we get benefit for our buck there, so to speak. So we, were, we flew three configurations, three flights each, using the same batch of B6 motors. And these were the recorded altitudes. Now this was using an altimeter. I don't want to get into altimeter accuracy or anything like that, but it was all in the same afternoon within an hour of each other, no significant weather anomalies, anything like that. We did throw out one flight because it had a piston tip and the data really wasn't uh, that reliable or, the, or that applicable. And then just to see whether we got any noise in that, we also did three bench tests uh, of the same weight configurations. And bench meaning a test stand in a fixed environment where we can get uh, eliminate all the, the noise and variability of friction fit on the on the piston alignment and stuff like that. And what we generally found was, uh, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, the uh, the average weight or the average altitudes for our three weights, 60 gram average was 574 feet, and standard deviation of the three flights 13.9. 88. Now that, remember, same model, we made the piston heavier. And we went about 75 feet higher, 70 feet higher. So counterintuitive, we added weight to the piston. We got higher performance and, nine, and a pretty tight distribution of the weight, or I'm sorry, the altitude. And we went to 116 grams and we got a little bit higher, 19 feet higher, but high standard deviation. And when we did the uh, uh, T squared and the, the P analysis, we basically found that that's noise. It, it's higher altitude, but not statistically different than we got on the 88. So the conclusion we found here was that we definitely got bang for the buck going from 60 to 88 grams. 11% uh, improved altitude above the impulse, rather. Um, we barely got any increase going from 88 to 116. So if this is the first time in our piston research we've ever hit what we found to be an optimum. All the other research we've done said we got better, but there's more beyond the horizon that we can't see. This is the first time we've ever crested a hill. So we've hit an optimum here for this particular motor thrust profile. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 88 grams is the ideal weight. Two minutes. Okay, thank you, sir. So for those of you who don't speak metric, think of that as about three ounce. And remember, the weight is the entire system of your piston tube, your piston head, your coupler, your model, your motor, tape, whatever you're throwing on it. Okay? So you want to aim for about three ounces of this guy if you're going up there to the tower or whatever you want to put it on to launch. You do that, and you're going to get a big benefit for an A8, a B6, and a C6, which all have roughly identical thrust profiles. This is the piston augmented thrust curve, comparing the four motors, or the four configurations. The blue line you can barely see on the bottom, that's a standard Estes thrust profile without a piston. Now you're used to seeing you know, a big spike, remember this is just the first two tenths of a second. Well, you're on the piston. So that motor hasn't really gotten into its s and graph thrust profile Jeez. spike yet. When you throw it on a piston though, 60 gram, you start to see the augmentation there, and the area under the graph above the blue is basically the bonus you get for a piston. And you can see on the 88 gram, we got a slightly later benefit, like it takes longer to build up, and a much higher benefit. These are Newtons on the left and time scale on the right. And the red is the 116. You can see that's not appreciably different than the green. It looks a little bit different, but you measure the, the impulse underneath the area under those curves, and they're roughly the same. So we are staying on the piston longer, taking a little bit longer to build up the pressure, and we get better benefit when we do build up that pressure by adding the weight. We can turn a lightweight altitude model into an egg loft kind of performer. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I've stressed those conclusions. Now I'll open up the questions. Thank you.
Uh, for the actual measurements that Patrick used, this is a 68 inch piston and I'll quickly show you how we construct it. It's two standard 34 inch tubes, that's how we came up with the math of 68. Uh, this would be the normal one with a thrust ring or stop at the bottom. This is just a naked tube. We join them just by holding them together, a little bit of wrap mylar tape. Uh, I put a, like a blank motor in there or something to keep them aligned when I put the tape on. And then you slide a coupler. Now normally we would just use a couple inch section. Keep them aligned. Okay, so what Patrick did to start with, because we were only talking like 30 grams, he just used the whole tube versus a two inch coupler. So that effectively added about 30 grams or so to it. And then you can do additional weight simply. You can get some of that, it's a, like a metal tape that you can wrap, a lead tape basically. Anything like that, you can tape washers, anything mm -hmm. on the outside here. Uh, now I launch typically, you need external guidance on this thing. When you get into 68 inch, you can't fly naked. You need some kind of tower or rail support. So I put couplers over here with rail button or rail guides. Those add a little bit of weight, so I could go with something on that end. And again, that's all shed once you've cleared the rail. Or the rail. <coughs> um, is there a way with your equations to predict what is the optimum mass given you know there's kind of for other types of motors with uh, different impulses? I would say that it should be predictable, but it would start with being, you'd have to start with the thrust curve itself. Mm -hmm. Because there's no magic math that says, hey, this weight and this piston length, here's how many impulses you're going to get. A Quest C6 versus an Estes C6 is going to be very different. So you'd have to start with that thrust profile. I would imagine if we joined forces with Chris Flanagan, we could probably nail down a lot of that. How's it been proving out of the field this week? Uh, well, the piston has performed reasonably well. We have not won any of the altitudes. I think we took uh, what, a second, a third. Uh, we've gotten very good boosts, but the models themselves have had some issues. We had a uh, what the altimeter today didn't record on our payload, so much. Yeah, we had one where the model separated, it was a great boost. Uh, the second one, we got a great boost, and the model said it didn't do anything, or rather the altimeter said it didn't do anything. And uh, I think on the egg loft, we came in second on that at about 120. And I've got a, a quick video, you can see the effect of the boost. I didn't track the whole flight, but it's really impressive to watch the, the 68 inch travel itself. I mean, it, it looks like a normal piston, but when you figure out that this thing is well through the <laughs> ceiling with the model still on it, uh, you, you, you've tripled the time on the, on the piston effectively. So being longer on the piston, does it get extra benefit because the motor thrust <coughs> is increasing during that time, or would that would the same thing happen if it was a constant thrust motor? Uh, if it, okay, the piston benefit is going to be because we are building pressure. So whether you're constant motor or wild thrust spikes, as long as you're not getting into oscillations where the piston has trouble traveling smoothly. Okay, because remember that as, as we're going up, there's got to be some air coming in. And there's got to be time, basically, for this thing to catch up with what the motor's trying to do. And the oscillations kind of <coughs> keep that. So as long as we're able to tame the oscillations, I would say it's not going to matter that much. That we can still get the benefit by staying on the piston as long as possible. If we could fly with a 120-inch piston, we would probably do so. But the rules cap us effectively today at 68 inch or two meters or something like that. We've tried the wacky telescoping piston to work around the rules, and, and that is possible. But I, I think Trip would probably put that up there with Pacific Flying Machines' approach to over engineering a solution that doesn't benefit anybody. Okay, questions from the audience? Yeah, Jake. So, Jen, I, I think you answered um, my first question already, so I'll just ask for confirmation. <clears throat> on the thrust curve, the multiple peaks with that is the oscillation occurring as it's, it's jerking up like that. Uh, yeah, the, the oscillation is preventing it from continuing up that happy path 
it, it's not a smooth thrust curve because it's it's moving jerky. As it is. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can pull that slide back up here very quickly. Okay, what's going on here, for instance, is we're building up the pressure, yep. and at that point, we gotta wait for the piston to catch back up. Yep. Okay, so there's a little breather here until we can yep. race up the next hill. Pressure builds, the piston lurches up, and then the pressure drops, and it's the piston slows down. Right, now what I, what I wanna stress is that at all of these points, we're still above zero and above the blue line. So even though we're in a trough here, so to speak, we're benefiting. Right. If we hadn't put initial volume here and we hadn't dampened the noise, we could actually be down here below zero, and that would be really bad. Yep. This is limited benefit. And what we want to do is, that, you know, the longer we spend on here, the more of these guys we're going to encounter, and these guys are bonus points on, on altitude. It's, it's free impulse. So during the pressure drops, the piston is still going up, it's just not accelerating. Right. Nobody's figured out how to have a perfectly smooth journey through a piston travel. So my real question now, since you answered that one, is since you're, you're the idea is to build up more pressure of the two before the rocket gets away, right? So do you have to alter the, the, the fit between the motor and the top of the piston to account for that extra pressure you want to build up? Uh, yeah, that, that's a field that you learn to develop. I tend to go with a pretty tight friction fit on there because I don't want an early separation. If I, if I leave early, uh, I'm typically still going up straight, but you don't want to be popping off here because you have a loose motor fit. You've left all this performance on the, on the table, so right, to speak. Right. Uh, I've seen others do tape and all that. Yeah. One more with Bob. Or? I'll right. let Bob have the last, the last question. He is the CD. He can overrule. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm looking at it, and, and you have your first two tenths of a second, and I recall from what we were doing ours that you referred to, we were taking videos with one of the older cameras that did about 18 frames a second. And one of the things on the ones that were non pistons is, is our control, there was about two tenths of a second of smoke coming out before there was enough thrust for the model to start moving at all, uh, even in the lightest models. So that's kind of that two tenths of a second we're talking about right there is that initial buildup of thrust probably? Uh, yeah, that could be. I mean, you, you can see at that point you're only talking about uh, four, two, two to four newtons, something like that. So, may I please? I know it's a We still have to go deliberate. Yeah. You can, you can talk to them.